I'd like to read from my text tonight from 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Who is your God? Who is my God? Who are you trusting? Who am I trusting? In these troubling times that we've found ourselves in, are we going to trust God? or man, our own devices, self? What are we going to lean on? Got to lean on something. Yeah. Psalm 20, verse 7, tells us that some trust in chariots. Mm -hmm. Some trust in horses. Mm -hmm. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Isaiah 31, verse 1, says, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but they look not under the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Woe to them. Well, I just read from my text, Elijah presented a question to the people. How long halt ye? How long are you going to vacillate between two opinions? Who's your God? Is it the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? The God of heaven and earth? Or is it this Baal that everybody seems to be worshiping? Who's your God? Well, earlier as the story goes, Israel had a... Uh, kind of progression downward of evil kings. And Ahab, it said, did more to provoke the Lord to anger than all the ones that were born for him. He was not good. No. To make matters worse, he took to wife Jezebel, and the things seemed to go, get, go downhill from there. Proceeded to worship Baal and cause Israel to worship Baal. And it got very bad. And all of a sudden, uh, Elijah shows up on the scene. And he tells Ahab, there's not going to be any dew, there's not going to be any rain, until I say so. See ya. <laughs> and he leaves. I have no idea what Ahab thought. He probably thought, this guy is crazy. Well, we'll see. Well, God, see, Elijah was trusting God, the God of heaven, yeah. the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's who he's trusting. He was a prophet of the Lord God of heaven. And I'm sure he was completely disgusted with what he saw in the society there, how it seemed like everybody had turned and was worshiping Baal, and had forgotten the Lord God of heaven. And so he made this proclamation, and then he goes out, and God said, I want you to go by this, this brook, and I want you to drink of the brook, and I'm going to provide ravens to come down and give you a food to eat. So we know that was of God. 
because that's not the norm. I don't know if you know anybody that lives by a brook and waits for birds to bring them food. I never heard of that other than what I read in the scripture, but that's what God's plan was. Well, because of the lack of dew and the lack of rain, even the brook that God told Elijah to go and hang out by dried up. So now what's he going to do? Well, I love this because it encourages our faith. When one thing uh, goes by the wayside, then we have to have faith that God's going to provide the next thing that's necessary because he promised that he would provide our every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So we have to believe that uh, if something falls through and he's promised to take care of us, then he has a plan even though we don't know what the plan is. And that's the challenging part because then that takes the faith and the trust in the Lord our God and our human understanding doesn't work very well. But Elijah trusted God. And God said, go over here. I provided a widow woman to sustain me. So he shows up, and she just happened to be out there uh, gathering some sticks. And he said, oh, uh, would you mind uh, getting me a drink of water? And by the way, make me a little cake, too. And she said, well, I'm just gathering two sticks for me and my son, and then we're going to die. We just have a little meal, a little oil. That's all we have left. The last meal. Yeah. Elijah says, makes me a little cake first. Yeah. And something in her must have believed in this, this man she'd never seen before, because he promised that God would provide. She didn't have anything to go on. But she did what Elijah asked. Made him a little cake first. Had enough to make some for her and her son. And it says that 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 barrel of meal and that that oil wasted not until God sent rain on the earth. And, And this is just a beautiful illustration of trust because God didn't all of a sudden show up and now they had major containers in the house of all this meal and all this oil and it's like, whoo, we've got it made. We've got enough in the house for years. Don't matter if it rains, we're good. No, they had enough for today. And then they had enough for the next day. And they had enough for the next day. That takes trust. Because you can't see it. Remember the children of Israel when they left Egypt and God provided manna for them? He said, get enough manna for one day. Except on Friday you get enough for two days because I want you to take Saturday the Sabbath off. And human nature, it's like, oh, we got to have more. We, we, we got to have some for tomorrow, too. We can't just have enough for today. So they gathered up more than they're supposed to, and guess what? It started rotting and being a problem, and God said, listen, I said, gather enough for today, except one day a week, gather enough for two. You know, so many times God's ways just don't make sense. Yeah. To us humans, it's like, why can't you just give us abundance and we don't have to worry about anything? Why do we have to, you know, okay, be content with the days and don't know about tomorrow, but God wants us to trust him. Yeah. And by the grace of God, we want to trust him. Amen. And we want to look to him in faith believing. Amen. Well, three and a half years go by and Elijah shows back up on the scene. And Ahab says, you're the one that's troubling Israel. Elijah said, sorry, you're the one that's troubling Israel because of the evil and the things that you are doing that displeases God. And so then Elijah proposed this question, which I read from my text. Get the people together. Let's get this thing settled. How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, then follow him. If Baal, 
then follow him. So he proposed a plan, get all the people, the 450 prophets of Baal, let's go on Mount Carmel, and we'll just test and see who the Lord God is. And this is Elijah's, what he proposed, then verse 22 in 1 Kings 18, then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and ye call on the name of your gods, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. So they heard the proposal, they go, That sounds good. We'll give it a try. You know, they, they must have had faith in their God. Right. I mean, to even agree to it. I mean, otherwise it's like they would have said, Oh, no, 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 that, that's not going to work. But they agreed to it. Right. And so Elijah said, you guys, you know, go, go ahead and go first. So they proceeded to pray to their God of Baal and whatever, and nothing happened. So Elijah kind of egged them on after a while and said, you know, maybe he's on vacation or gone or, you know, sleeping or something. You know, you get him woke up or, you know, get his attention. So they, they really got fired up. Boy, they started dancing around cutting themselves, and I mean, this has got to get our God's attention. Nothing happened. Well, that's how other gods work. Right. They're not real. Right. It's just uh, imagination. Our God, yes. the creator of heaven and earth, Amen. the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yeah. he does the impossible. He provides man in the wilderness. He provides a, a bird to feed a man. He provides veal and oil in a vessel to feed a widow woman and her son and a man of God. That's our God. Well, it was Elijah's turn. And he said he repaired the altar that was torn down, broken down took 12 stones, put the wood on it, put the bullock on there, and he got the most precious thing that was available, water, and had 12 uh, barrels of water dumped over that whole thing, and he had a trench around Amen. the sacrifice. You see, Elijah... He wanted them to know that there was no sleight of hand. He didn't pull something and have a little spark under there sometimes. So when he, certain times, it's like all of a sudden this thing would go. No, he, he wanted to know there was no doubt yeah. Yeah. Amen. who the real God is. And I love Elijah's prayer. Verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their face and said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. That's the God we're serving. The one that can answer by fire. The one that uh, Jesus, when he was here on earth and he was in the boat and the, the storm came up and the disciples finally went and woke him up and said, carest thou not that we perish because the boat was being filled with water and Jesus just got up and rebuked the wind and the waves and there was a great calm. That's the God we're serving. Yeah. 
Doesn't matter many, doesn't matter how many of them there are, but it matters who we are connected to. There was 450 prophets of Baal. There was only one prophet of God, Elijah, but he was in touch with the true God, and he won. Daniel in the lion's den, probably one of the favorite Bible stories of kids. But it's so, so good, you just can't wear it out. I have no clue how many sermons I've used the example, but it's applicable again tonight. Daniel, now an older man, was taken a captive as a young man to Babylon and had been through a lot. But he was promoted to the, the top um, president of, of three, so he was right under the king, and the other men was, were jealous of him. And so they watched Daniel's life, and they could not find any fault with his life. And they finally said, the only thing we can come up with is how loyal he is to his God. So they uh, appealed to the king's ego and said, hey, we've talked about this, and we want to have a little proposal. Let's have, nobody can ask any petition of any god or man for 30 days except for you, king. What do you think? Oh, you know, appealed to his ego. He said, okay, yeah, let's do it. Well, they had a plan, an evil plan, to trap Daniel. And they knew that Daniel opened his windows towards Jerusalem, three times a day and prayed to his God. And so that was their plan. They were out to destroy Daniel. Daniel hears the decree. So now Daniel has a decision. Is he going to honor his God and open his windows and pray three times a day like he did before? Or is he going to cower and say, my life's on the line. I'm going to be thrown into the lines. What use am I going to be if I'm dead? I just can't do this. I've got to, I've just, I can't open my windows. I'm sure he could have justified that I can still pray to God. I just won't open my windows for 30 days. But there was something in Daniel that there was zero compromise. I mean, it doesn't appear that he even considered wavering, but he, verse 10 of chapter 6 of Daniel tells us, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and in windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Well, the men were waiting. They caught him. They take him to the king. He said, King, you signed this order. He disobeyed it. it. Has to be thrown to the lions. The king loved Daniel. Even though he wasn't a godly king, he loved Daniel. And he realized that they had uh, tricked him. They had deceived him into doing something to take Daniel down. And he did everything in his power as king of that kingdom to change it, and he couldn't. So he had no choice but to follow through on the decree and cast Daniel into the den of lions. They did. But Daniel had quite a testimony because the king, before he threw him in there, had this to say. And when he came to the den, that's the one before, and the King demanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. That king had faith in Daniel's God. I mean, he didn't, he didn't say, I mean, he said he will deliver thee. Yet that night, that king d- couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep. It's like he couldn't hardly stand himself. It's like, you know what happens when lions and food is around. They, they just, they're hungry. Well, the next morning, real early, the king's down there, 
And he says, when he came to the den, he cried in a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God. I love that. Not just your God, like Baal or some, whoever God that people want to serve. Servant of the living God is thy God, whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lion. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel, and hath shut the lions' mouths, that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocent was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. And the Lord and the king was exceeding glad, and had Daniel taken out, because yeah. no matter of hurt was upon him, because he believed in his God. Amen. Daniel didn't know whether he would be alive or not, but his faith and trust in God was so strong when his life was on the line, he says, you know what? My allegiance is to my God, and whether he decides to spare me or not, I have to trust my God. Over and over and over again in the Word of God, every single time uh, somebody trusted God, God has never let them down. Uh, And I just love the way God works. I mean, that would be sufficient, being delivered from the lion's den. But God goes above and beyond. So he says afterwards, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth and worketh signs and wonders in heaven and earth, who hath delivered Daniel over the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. God blessed Daniel. God's good. You know, when we're on this side and we don't see the other side of the challenge, it can be very discouraging and it's like, is our God going to deliver us? But by faith and trust in God, we have to say, our God will deliver us. Our God will take us through. In closing, I'd like to read a few verses from Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You see, our God is alive and well. Jesus, our Savior, the one that uh, gave his life on Calvary, he's up there in heaven tonight uh, at the right hand of the Father. And when we pray in uh, our simple prayer and our simple request and our frustration and our fear or whatever it may be, we can pray and we have an intercessor, Jesus, the Son of God, before the Father, and he makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him, through Jesus, that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Who are you trusting? Who am I trusting? Oh, may we trust in that God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of of Elijah, the God of Daniel, oh, the God of Esther. Uh, Her her response was, if I perish, I perish. Life's on the line. I'm going to trust in my God. May we have it down in our hearts. Lord, we don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know what the future brings, but you've brought us this far. You've never let us down this far. We're going to keep trusting, and we know you will come through. 
Just like that king said to Daniel, your God will deliver you. May we uh, in confidence say our God will deliver us. We know it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. May God give us the grace and uh, uh, just the determination as these worthies in the Bible and worthies that we've known on this earth to just stand up for the Lord and he will take us through. We're going to have a closing song, 602, invite each one to come and pray.